Okay. And this is what Agamemnon, well, this is the meaning of Agamemnon's work after Foucault. Life in modernity is the floating signifier, both sacred and sacrificial. This is what explains his title, Homo Saker. Something which is neither in nor out society, and in and out at the same time. This is exactly the status, as we know, of what Agamemnon calls bare life. Something which is nowhere, neither within or, nor outside the community. Which is both sacred and offered to murder. So modernity starts when life itself coincides with the symbolic as its very locus. And we will see that when life itself becomes the symbolic or the floating signifier, and this is uh, how Agamemnon radicalizes Foucault's work, when life itself becomes the very locus of the symbolic or the empty space, it loses, loses any kind of biological uh, meaning. Why has life become the locus of modern uh, sacredness, that is, both sacredness and sacrifice? This question is a difficult one, and there may be several answers to it. Again, Benz is very radical on that point. Showa is the answer. And we know that Agamemnon reproaches Foucault his lack of radicality on this point. Sovereignty is not only the transformation of biological uh, categories into symbol. Sovereignty is what constitutes biology as the only uh, meaning horizon. That is why, that is why he can write that con the concentration camp. You know what he says about that. Uh, the concentration camp is the contemporary paradigm for biopolitics. So in Agamben, it's not only that biology is the ve vehicle of sovereignty, it is that biology is in itself not, well, is it, it's potentially not different from biologism. There is no strict limit between biopower such and Nazism. So it goes even for, further than Foucault. will go even, even further by saying that the, subject, the subjection of life by biology and by power is in itself a sacrifice. As if life itself understood as this floating signifier, this excess of meaning, as if life itself offered itself voluntarily to its reduction <coughs> to well, to the reduction of its multiplicity, to the unification of both biological and political concepts. I read from Faith and Knowledge, paragraph 40. Life is inhabited, Dada writes, by a principle of self-destruction, ruining the principle of self-protection. And this symbolic dimension of life by which life offers itself to its own sacrifice, and particularly its own biological sacrifice. Uh, this dimension is what exceeds, in any case, any biological definition of life. Biological life has no autonomy. It depends on this sacrificial, more originally sacrificial logic in inherent to life. I put another passage very brief. Life, and this is what I, I'm trying to understand when Dera says life has absolute value only if it is worth more than life. This more than life means this mm, symbolic excess of life over its biological definition. Uh, life has absolute value only if, it, if it's worth more than life. And he adds more than what? more than the natural and the zoological life. So life, if we understand that correctly, it means that the meaning of life has nothing, well, that the biological meaning of life is absolutely derived from something which definitely exceeds forever this biological content. Life is 
more than itself. It means that life is more than its biological definition. And this more is what I understand to be the floating signifier, the blank space, this more, this excess. So this surplus of meaning of life, which is both the sacred and the sacrificial, well, which is in Foucault, first of all, uh, the symbol of production. And then in Agamben and Derrida, this sacrificial uh, logic is always prior to the biological. This is why biological life is always derived and has no autonomy. And that's why also the idea of resisting bio powers always implies a kind of escape from the real of the biological. Once again, in these philosophers, for these philosophers, like Foucault, Derrida, Agamben, there is no way in which we can use biology or the biological categories in order to criticize sovereignty. Because in any case, biology is always derived from a more originary economy, which is always symbolic, never uh, empirical. And of course, this is what I interpret as the remnants of metaphysics in their approaches. Uh, the persistence of something like vitalism, uh, this more, life is more than itself. This is something which is extremely strange in Derrida. How can you be the father of deconstruction and write that life is always more than itself? This supplement being absolutely non-biological, but always symbolic. <laughs> I think, uh, and this will be my second and last part, that it is possible not to have done with life, but to have done with such a split I mean the split between the biological and the symbolic. I think we have to have done with this split. And that, um, it seems to me that some current biological categories are providing us with means of resistance to sovereignty, but also as tools of resistance to philosophy itself. And to this uh, uh, fetishization of the symbolic, you know, be, be it understood as a symbol, as the sacred, or as the sac sacrificial logic, according to which life would always escape its empirical and natural definition. I think it is possible to have done with this play. And of course, it is a very ambitious project because I would like to show that it is the end of the symbolic biological uh, distinction. To give an example of a possible, uh, um, well, demise of this split, I will develop the notion of epigenetic, well, the term epigenetic, constitutes, according to me, one of the most important current biological categories. Epigenetic. It comes from epigenetics, which is a science. Epigenetics is a science. Uh, the name epigenetics comes from the Greek epi and genesis. Epi meaning over, above, or aside. Something which is also epigenetic. Epigenetics would be something which situates itself over, above, or on the side of genetics. It is a science which studies non-genetic changes. To understand exactly what it is, it, it is very technical, so I'll be very simple and not, I, I won't enter into like, technical definitions and, and will uh, try just to um, uh, bring to light the philosophical content of this notion. We are familiar with the notion of epigenesis, which, as we know, is a theory opposed to pre-formationism in the 18th century. Epigenesis was a theory uh, which affirmed that the embryo 
is not preformed but develops itself through time. Something remains, something from this uh, previous meaning remains in the contemporary notion of epigenetics. Uh, we have the genetic code, right, the DNA sequence, which is determined and preformed. It is the ordering of nucleotides in the DNA program. But, and this is what epigenetics does, this code has to be interpreted. That is, as I <coughs> said, translated or transcribed in order to be individualized. This is the passage from the genotype to the phenotype you were referring to, Adrian. So the passage from a general code to the individual form, I mean the, the, the individuals that we are. This is how, well, in order to realize this passage, to accomplish this transition, uh, an interpretation of the DNA code is necessary. And this is what epigenetic processes do, to transcribe the DNA uh, into proteins via the RNA. It's a question of translation, of transcription. So as I said, this transcription is due to epigenetic factors, and what they do, these factors, is to activate or, on the contrary, silence certain genes in order to fashion the phenotype. The term epigenetics was coined by Waddington in 1942. I quote uh, Waddington's, Waddington's definition. Epigenetics is the branch of biology which studies the causal interaction between genes and their products which bring the phenotype into being. So the causal interaction between genes and their products, that is between genes and their transcription. Today, uh, we find this very general definition. Epigenetics, I quote from Wikipedia, is the study of changes in genome function that occur without a change in the DNA sequence. In, in other words, epigenetic change, well, epigenetics is the study of non-genetic changes. By extension, epigenetics also includes factors like culture, education, the influence of environment on our general biological structure. The brain, for example, we know that the brain's development is for the most part dependent upon such epigenetic factors and that what sculpts our brain throughout our life uh, is uh, a, well, uh, an, an ensemble of uh, epigenetic factors such as, well, just experience, well, the way in which, the way uh, our <coughs> ways of life are sculpting, fashioning our, the biological shape of the brain. So, it means that we are not pre-programmed, that the genetic code has to be interpreted and transformed through this epigenetic translation. So we are not pre-programmed, but we are shaped. And this is why scientists talk about plasticity of the genome, meaning that the genome has to be transcribed and interpreted in terms of epigenetic, epigenetic factors. I will quote 